well, I've been looking forward to this talk. What do you do when you meditate? Or as my wife advises me to give a talk, so you think you're meditating? <laughs> but I, I don't know if I'm gonna go there. So first let me just say that there are many different kinds of meditation and different traditions. Um, there's a loose distinction between meditations that are nested in a religious or theistic frame in reference to, let's say, a divinity, a higher power, a sacred ground, a, a god, um, and meditations that are secular in their framing and their or their and and purpose. A broad distinction. Inside that broad distinction, wow, looking around the world, including the traditions of the first people, the native indigenous people around the world, there are so many different contemplative practices. So I'm not trying to sort all those out. I will try to offer, though, sort of three basic questions. And then inside each of those three, three suggestions, three times three gives you nine. I will just stop there, fear not. And uh, we'll open it up for some discussion. And periodically, I'll take a look over at the chat sidebar to see, you know, what kind of trouble I've caused. All right. So um, first question is really, when you meditate, what are you strengthening? What are you trying to strengthen? What are you training? I remember being in a small group with the Zen teacher, Yvonne Rand, uh, whose center has an amusing and wonderful title, uh, Goat in the Road. Anyway, so um, Yvonne Rand just asked us suddenly or made a comment at some point that we're training. We're training. We're training our heart. We're training our minds. Um, part of the training is a releasing, but we're training. Okay, what are you training? What are you developing? And so I'll offer three things here for you to think about that you could be strengthening already when you're meditating, or maybe with a little more deliberate attention, you could be you know, deliberately focusing on. The first is obviously regulating attention. Again and again, we bring a wandering mind back. Over a century ago, William James, the godfather of American psychology, wrote, to summarize and paraphrase, that the capacity to bring a wandering attention back is really the foundation of having a sense of autonomy and agency as a human being in this world. So we train attention. Sometimes we begin with really focusing on staying with some object of attention four times in a row, 10 times in a row. A simple way to do that if you're using breathing is to count each breath uh, kind of softly in the back of your mind, not obsessively, just, oh. And if you like, you can go up to four. Right around four to six is roughly when people tend to lose focus. So if you go to four, you could just go to four and start over again. Kind of a simple way to do it. Or go up to 10 or count down from 10. You can do that. Another way to help yourself stay present uh, with your breath or any other object is to note it to simply softly say in the back of your mind, for example, with the breath, in, out, or rising, falling, all right? I think Thich Nhat Hanh had a meditation in which as, he, as you inhale, you kind of think softly to yourself, arriving, or I am arriving. And then on the exhalation, I am home or simply home, however you like. Uh, over time, attention tends to become more trained, interestingly and neurologically, and you know, meditators who are very experienced tend to have less activation in the parts of the brain, notably the anterior cingulate cortex, among others, that exercise strong top-down control over our attention, because over time, they've gotten more efficient at staying in the present, they're just kind of plop, kind of dropped right in, plop, like a proverbial frog in the pond, plop. And as they plop, here they are, being here now. Okay, that's one of the first things that's really useful to focus on training or strengthening as we meditate. And a second is motivation, motivation to practice. 
the Buddha uh, really emphasized motivation, both the more cognitive aspects of it, like understanding the reasons why, and frankly, a more visceral dimension of just bringing our muscles into it, just kind of leaning in, doing what's good you know, to do, even if we don't really want to do it in the moment, leaning in. And the Buddha talked as well, and it's an important point, when we're strengthening motivation, to feel drawn toward drawn toward calming and peacefulness and settling and easing. Such a beautiful thing. So you can think already right there, these sort of three aspects of motivation that we can train in. And we can, of course, broaden this motivation to practice in general, not just what we do formally on the cushion, as it were. So the reasons why, knowing what your reasons are, what's your why? That's useful. Second, there's a certain place for the will, or leaning in, for being strong, or doing it even if it's uncomfortable or you're kind of reluctant. And third kind of motivation or aspect of motivation is to feel attracted, to feel drawn to that which is beautiful, wholesome, sacred, awake, because it's, it, it pulls you, it, it's alluring. In, in the best sense of that word. Okay, second aspect uh, of something we can train in or strengthen. And third, certainly, warmth and compassion for yourself. That kind of warm-hearted sense of being for yourself, being on your own side and an ally, of a, a, a supporter of yourself rather than an attacker and critic and naysayer for yourself. And compassion, a sense of Awareness of your own suffering, things that are difficult for you, combined with a kind of tender-hearted concern, a supportiveness, a wishing that you didn't suffer much as you might feel uh, for someone else who was like you. All right, and the training in meditation of uh, that sense of compassion for yourself and warm-heartedness can help us to bear and uh, what we become aware of through steadying our mind and becoming more, more present, in the present with all that is going on with us, some of which might be kind of spooky or seem um, painful to be aware of, uh, or including you know, the longings of the heart that have not been fulfilled. So it's important to be able to have compassion for yourself so that you know that you're willing to and you're able to open up to that material. So it can flow while you remain steadily present. Okay. So. Okay, so far? All right. Second question for you while you meditate what are you letting go of? What are you releasing? What are you encouraging out the door? Classic first is tension in the body. We can scan the body, maybe from the top to the bottom. You might imagine an old technique that there are valves in the tips of your fingers and the tips of your toes through which maybe like a orange colored liquid tension, strain, stress is leaving your body. And you can let yourself become more tranquil. Tranquility in Buddhism is one of the seven factors of enlightenment, awakening. Tranquilizing the body is one of the steps in the foundations of mindfulness practice, particularly in terms of mindfulness of breathing. Tranquilizing the body. So you relax and you find a posture that supports you in being relaxed. You let go of tensions in the body. Ha! Ah, exhaling. Simple. As we exhale, we engage the parasympathetic branch of the nervous system, which is inherently calming and soothing. And as we exhale, the heart rate tends to slow naturally. All right, well, letting go, letting go. Next one, we tend to let go of as we meditate, I'll call it mental emotional clutter. And how I kind of imagine it, sort of experience it, is that the mind is like a pond, 
water's awareness. And uh, in ordinary life, the pond is full of sediment. It's like algae. We have actually a pond in our backyard with some goldfish in it. And so, you know, I'm familiar with ponds. I, I spend a fair amount of time trying to help them stay fairly clear. But anyway, like my own mind. So there you are. You're in your mind. You're thinking about all sorts of things. There's a lot of emotional clutter in there as well. Desires, plans, little mini movies, resentments, fantasies. That's the sediment in the pond of awareness. And we gradually kind of help it settle down. We let go of it. We sometimes uh, recognize that there's no cheese down that tunnel. There's, it's not that great to think about that same thing for the 10th time. We can let it go. We become disenchanted is a traditional instruction to become disenchanted with the mental formations. They're just, they are what they are. They're not bad, but eh, are they really that great? Is it really that great to be, to hop on board the Rumination Express? Yeehaw, first class ticket on the Rumination Express. What's that trip like? Yeah, so there's a kind of letting go, a kind of letting go of mental clutter, and you can see and feel that your mind, not just your body, is becoming more tranquil as a result. And after a while, as the sediment settles down, you gradually release the clutter a lot because you just don't reinforce it. Not reinforcing it, not following after it, not resisting it, really helps it increasingly just kind of settle out on its own with a gentle intention in the background of releasing, letting go, letting go. When that happens, eventually, the clear water of awareness that was always the case, always pure, never itself tainted by what it holds. As the sediments settle, the clear water of awareness is all that's there. And in the Tibetan metaphor, then you can see the jewels. Ah lying on the bottom that we're always already there. So second aspect, it's not the only one, but it's one I'm, I want to name here of letting go is letting go of metal cl mental clutter. Okay, so far? Okay. So then a third uh, kind of thing we can let go of and typically do let go of as we meditate is the self-contraction. The inner preoccupations with me, 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 my precious, my positions, my drama with other people, my resentments that they have not treated me better, my uh, you know, self-referential remorse about what I should have done, my guilt about what I should have done. Increasingly, all of that, we let it go. We become increasingly aware of it as it arises, which helps us let it go. And one of the things also uh, in all this is we sort of start to disidentify with various reactions. Um, it, we start to make the shift from, uh, I really want this, to there is desire. Or we make the shift from, you treated me really badly. Two, there is resentment, there is anger, there are fantasies of vengeance. We shift out of self-referential processing. And as research shows, actually, we start to settle into more of a holistic, spacious, all-inclusive sense of being, of personing along the way with a, a kind of, it's called decentered a decentering of the contracted, centered positionality uh, with a lot of presumptions baked into it that there's some kind of unified, independent, and enduring entity inside that is the I. Instead, we start to recognize that self is a process. Who was it? Buckminster Fuller, who said, I seem to be a verb. I seem to be a verb, right? There is personing inside the broad eddy in the stream of reality of personing. There are other eddies, including the arising, persisting, and then passing away of a 
sense of self for a bit, it's fine. But over time, you start to recognize that that sense of self is not actually just always the same. And you start to recognize that it's in fact made of many parts that are dynamic and changing and not independent, but actually arise dependently. The sense of self arises dependently uh, and decreases dependently based on various conditions rather than having a kind of independent existence all its own. So that's a progression of insight into, into oneself over time, oneself as the person altogether. And just to finish here on what we let go of as we meditate, uh, we can gradually let go of these kind of fixed viewpoints, the self, you know, self-referential thinking, uh, coming back to ourselves. We start disengaging from the self story we tend to tell ourselves. We we stop fueling it. We stop reinforcing it. We stop adding it to it. And whoosh, more and more, you know, where there is persons, persons certainly exist with less and less sense of self as we meditate. <clears throat> okay? Okay. Then third big thing we do when we meditate, and I'll ask it as a question, where are you resting? So what are you training? What are you letting go of? And where are you dwelling? Where are you resting? Most fundamentally. You may know this traditional saying, your mind takes its shape from what it repeatedly rests upon. Modern uptake with neuroplasticity, your brain takes its shape, literally, in terms of structure and function, uh, based on where your attention, your mind, rests repeatedly with, with the fact taken into account that the brain has a negativity bias, makes it like Velcro for bad experiences, but Teflon for good ones. So it, you know, when we rest on rumination or negative self-criticism or feelings of inadequacy or uh, angry preoccupations with other people, uh, we tend to take that shape, not so good. So where do you dwell? Where do you dwell? Where do you rest when you meditate? For me, my simplest description of what I'm trying to do when I meditate is I'm resting my mind upon what draws my heart. And so gradually take the shape of and establish within myself that which I long for, that which feels like the next step to stabilize in my own awakening process. So several things to come to mind uh, when people uh, talk about where they're resting or helping themselves to rest during meditation. First, awareness. Resting in awareness, uh, distinct from the objects of awareness, the various flotsam and jetsam passing along in the streaming of consciousness. And as the stream of consciousness gets quieter and quieter, and there's less and less sediment or flotsam and jetsam, what becomes more and more just the case is a resting as awareness. There is awareness. There is a wearing as a process that's ongoing. Aware. Wakeful, present, aware. Not much content. There might be in that a sense of spaciousness, the sky of mind, sometimes described. Um, Pema Chodron and others have used the metaphor of we are the sky. Everything else is simply weather, clouds coming and going. Abiding as awareness. As soon as you start thinking about the fact that you are abiding as awareness, <laughs> That thought is now an object in awareness. It's some piece of content represented within awareness. No worries. Let it relax. Let it subside and back into awareness. Uh, a metaphor for me about this, and um, back to the pond, but slightly different metaphor, is to imagine that awareness is like the surface of a pond. And typical stressed out, frazzled, running a million miles an hour with your hair on fire, speaking personally, kind of mind, you know, the surface of that pond is fairly agitated as if a, a pretty stiff breeze was blowing over the surface, ruffling it and creating all these little, little waves and peaks and troughs in the surface, even some big ones, let's say, the surface of the pond. As our minds get quieter, 
and our bodies get calmer and we, we engage what I've said so far, you know, we train in steadiness of mind and warm heartedness for ourselves. We let go of tension in the body, flotsam and jetsam. We, you know, let go more and more of the sense of self. Ooh, the surface of the pond of awareness becomes increasingly still so that there is only awareness. And then there might be occasionally little ruffles, like maybe a background ongoing sense of the sensations of breathing, but really not much more than that. More and more, you know, the signals are dropping out and there's just this underlying representing capacity in the neural substrates of consciousness. Whoosh, presence, present moment awareness with little content. So we, we rest there. And that's a real um, that's a real practice to develop over time, to be able to simply rest, rest in awareness itself. Diana Winston, by the way, has a lovely book about this, The Little Book of Being. And she talks about the movement that I've also explored in previous talks a couple months ago, uh, the movement from focused attention, as we began with in the meditation, to open awareness, where we're still stably present, aware maybe of breathing, but mainly we're, we're just open to whatever's passing through, to increasingly abiding simply as awareness itself. Typically when or as what's passing through tends to get quieter and quieter. So, and her book's called The Little Book of Being, highly recommended. Diana Winston um, is a teacher down in Los Angeles, co-founder, I believe, of the Mindful Awareness Research Center at UCLA, Diana Winston. Okay. So finishing here, two more things that we can dwell in in our meditation that I think are really useful. Uh, I call it the green zone. It's basically a mind of little craving, very little craving, very little uh, drivenness or grasping or resisting or clinging. And what supports that for us biologically is to have an, a, a sense of fullness and enoughness in the present so we don't need to crave for anything more. And kind of there are three major aspects of that based on our three major needs. Uh, one, as I mentioned during the meditation, to have a sense of, of warmth. This goes back to that thing we train in where you feel that there's enough healthy connection in the present. There's enough love in the present. It'd be nice to have more, but in the present, you're, you're rested in an enoughness of lovingness, an enoughness of caring and feeling cared about. You can also help yourself rest in a growing sense of peacefulness, which is supported by the sense of tranquility that in the present, you're basically all right right now. And you can, you don't have to struggle with feeling threatened in the present, right? Peacefulness and enoughness of safety, in other words. And last, contentment and enoughness of satisfaction. That, ah, it's nice to have more. It's definitely okay to keep pursuing, you know, healthy goals. And there can be a sense of feeling content already. That's very helpful to dwell in and to let yourself have these experiences. I, I think from my experience in the kind of Western world of mindfulness, Buddhism, and meditation, there just has been not enough attention to what's available now for us to understand that biologically we're driven toward craving based on the sense of something missing, something wrong. So a natural corrective is to help ourselves have authentic experiences when they are available, which is a lot of the time for most people, authentic experiences in the present of fullness rather than deficit, of balance rather than disturbance. And as we dwell increasingly in that, the biological basis for craving is absent. It's not there. We might be left with habits of craving and subtle cognitive processes that tend to continually grasp after forms. Um, but the major biological engine of craving is absent. 
when you feel already peaceful, contented, and rested in love. Very useful place to, to dwell. Okay. And then last, this is a little fuzzier, but it certainly is something that people talk about, and it's certainly available to us in our practice, and I speak to it uh, sometimes in my suggestions in meditation. It's to rest in the ground of being. Rest in what it's like to be you in the broadest sense, the you process, the person process. What's it like to be you when you're not adding anything? to the moment. What's it like to be you when you're not trying to do anything? Really interesting. What's there when doing falls away, when selfing falls away? It's not a big blank. We don't go unconscious. We don't become catatonic. It gets very interesting. When what, What's present when active processes of separating and dividing internally and externally um, fall away. And you feel increasingly undivided internally and increasingly soft in the boundaries between you and reality, you and everything else. So you increasingly kind of drop down into um, being rather than becoming. Also aided by resting in the green zone, you're not trying to become anything or anywhere or anyone. You're, you're just being. Not seeking any gaining, simply breathing, simply sitting, simply awake, simply being. And in this, you start to have a sense of opening out into the ground of being of reality altogether. Because of course, there is simply reality in which, which itself as a whole is undivided, fundamentally, certainly at the quantum level. And you just feel more and more, ah, this, this, beyond words, beyond description, this, no problem. That's definitely, you know, a process to abide there. But certainly, certainly what teachers like Henry Schuckman and others talk about and is available to us, the ground. Yeah. Who are you? What's it like to be you when you're not adding anything or struggling with anything or avoiding anything or dividing anything? What's it like to be you when you're not going anywhere? This. Just this. Okay. So, quick review. What, what do you do when you meditate? What could you do when you meditate? And more generally, what could you do as you live all together? First, what are you training? What are you strengthening? What are you developing? Such as, Steadiness of mind, you know, regulation of attention, motivation for practice, and wholesome, uh, virtuous living. And third, warmth and compassion, including for yourself. These are three things we can be training. There are other things we can train as well, certainly those three. Next question, what are you releasing? What are you letting go of? Three candidates for you. Tension in the body. You know, we tend to live with, so, with a lot of tension, of contraction and acceleration. We're accelerating. We're revving up. Whoosh, it becomes very habitual. We can get kind of addicted to speed. Um, not the amphetamine necessarily, although there is that too. So whoosh, we let go of tension. Right? We also can let go of mental emotional clutter. So many of our thoughts are not worth pursuing. So many of our emotional reactions don't have much 
cheese down that particular tunnel. We let go of that clutter, and third, we can let go of the sense of self. Less and less sense of self-contraction, more and more of a seeing through, the construction, the dynamic constructing and deconstructing of the self-process. And then last, where do you dwell? What are you resting? Where, where, where are you resting? And three things there, we can rest in awareness, we can rest in a mind of little craving because we feel already full, the green zone of fullness and balance, characterized with a general sense of peacefulness, contentment, and love. We can rest there. And most, um, most fully and most difficult to talk about, we can rest and, and feel rested in simply being, in, in beingness, uh, who we are when we're not doing anything or going anywhere. Okay, well, there you have it. What do you do when you meditate? All right, this is a great question, actually. So it's private, but I'll, I can, I'll quote it. You spoke of a first-class ticket on the Rumination Express. Can you offer some advice on how to return that ticket and get off the train? Thank you. Great question, right? Um, one of the best ways to get off the Rumination Express is to notice that you've hopped on board. Because as soon as you notice you've hopped on board, to borrow a metaphor from Sharon Salzberg, boom, you're back in the meadow, chilling as the train goes on by. Really good. Second, tune into the internal sensations of your body. Major way to neurologically toss a circuit breaker in, click a circuit breaker, which disrupts the default mode network activation behind rumination. Internal sensations of breathing, the sense of yourself altogether. Third, great one is widen your view. Because when we ruminate, if you know, you know, we're 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 con, we're kind of carried along in a bubble. It's as if we're in this little mini movie and kind of oblivious to everything else. You know, like you're watching a movie or maybe on your TV and you know, you don't notice anything around you. That's like rumination, except it's a crummy movie, typically. So if you deliberately go wide, the whole room, the room as a whole, reality as a whole, the big picture, bird's eye view, that's going to tend to take you out of rumination. And with habit, you'll, you'll get less caught up in the rumination express. It also helps to become kind of disabused of the value of rumination. You know, a little bit of that is helpful. Some studies show a little bit of, you know, daydreaming, mind wandering, a little bit of ruminating, it's fine. But... You know, if you're spending a lot of time in the ruminator or on the rumination express, probably not a good thing. Okay. Well, okay, great. Rick, hello, Rick. Um, I'm going to ask you to unmute. I like your backdrop there. Howdy. And Dr. Hansen, thank you very much again uh, for uh, a great talk and, and a wonderful meditation. I mean, for me, it was just a very deep experience as it has been, I think, for the last... Uh, few months uh, spending time with good um yeah i guess what i'd like to ask is um because all of this makes just an enormous amount of sense to me in terms of um baby steps toward greater happiness and more contentment and i think if i did this <laughs> on a regular more systematic basis i i would achieve a much greater degree of happiness um between with myself as well as with other people yeah. but i guess what what i'm curious about is is how do you square this with the other kind of major goals that folks have for 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 your life um the, yeah the skills that you try to develop the um the things that you try to achieve yeah you know, because you know I, under, I understand that satisfaction and contentment are very, you know, those are primary, uh, at least two of the goals yeah. of, of practicing in this way. But if I think about folks like, well, Rick Hansen, <laughs> I mean, you've achieved a lot. Independent of your practice, yeah. you've a great deal. And, and you have to tell me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a sense of contentment and a great deal of satisfaction from what you have achieved. And then you can think about people like Barack Obama, oh, and I don't know, FDR, Steph Curry, uh, great musicians, uh, Miles so, Davis. So I got it. Yeah. So, 
So I guess I can I want... respond? Yeah. Okay. So that's good. And I, I want to also make time for other people too. And so I've known you, Rick, for quite a while, right? So we know each other. And and honestly, I've watched you change over the years. I've you know watched you from the very beginning um, in the sitting group we did at Dominican University, and I've just observed you. A quieter mind, more more kind of self ease. Some of that, I'm sure, is situation specific as we get to know each other better. But there is progress, and I think we could take uh, support from who else? The Dalai Lama, who talks about his own process of becoming less angry. Let's say over time, gradually over time. So a couple things here. One is to really ask yourself, and it's a question that Gil Fronstel asked me a long time ago, how important is awakening to you? And if it's not that important, it's not that important. But if it is that important, uh, he said, it's a little bit like wanting to become a really strong triathlete. You just make choices and you create room for it. You start allocating more time, for example, to meditating every day for a minute or more, or you start allocating more time. Your, your sits become longer. Maybe you start it, you sit in the morning, and then you add a little sit before you go to bed. You also start bringing in, uh, can, you know, wholesome beneficial influences over your day. Uh, the music you listen to, maybe there's a little background talk going. Uh, maybe you have people in your life you, you can share some aspects of practice with. It starts to become more and more an aspect of your life, and there is a dosing effect. I mean, some people um, are just unusual naturals. They step off a bus and it's white light and, you know, forever after. But most of us, me included, there's a dosing effect. There's a loose but real relationship between effort in and results back. So that's a specific thing. And then the other thing you said, um, it's very interesting. It's a classic apparent conundrum. And for some people, it's very real. Do they go into a monastery and take vows or do they stay engaged in the world with social justice action? Or how do they square their their needs to be a breadwinner, to support their family, to have a, an, an income, with the wish that they spend two, one to three months a year on retreat? And you can't do both often. So how do you balance those things? What I would say is that, as many people have found, a contemplative practice helps us be more functional in our relationships and in our work. It supports us in that area. And as we do accomplish things, and as we do experience, last time you talked about you know, interactions with your partner, uh, as we do experience positive interactions with other people, and we do experience accomplishments of various kinds, including you know, sailing the boats maybe, or one of them that I see behind you, we take that in and we can internalize that as um, a beneficial emotional memory that gradually fills us up from the inside out and supports that green zone resting. So there's less and less basis for a sense of something missing something wrong and therefore less fuel for grasping and craving. Okay, yeah, so I'm gonna- I don't, keep, I don't keep grasp going. or crave at all. But that's <laughs> good, I'm glad that now. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let that one go. That's great, Rick, yeah. and. Uh, I think also it's really great to keep looking internally. I mean, we can sometimes think about or ask questions that are almost more hypothetical or they're, they're almost framed from the outside in. And it's really good to keep looking internally, which you do, um, about you know, kind of your own inner dynamics. Anyway, okay, excellent. And any one of those nine things, I'll say this to everybody here, any one of those nine things that I ran through is good to do during meditation. If you just do one for a few minutes total over the course of a 35 minute meditation, that's pretty darn good, right? And if you start to bring, yeah, more to bear in your everyday life, mo better. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Rick. Okay, Georgia, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. I think I'll be able to get to Mary D and then we'll probably have to call it a wrap. Okay, Georgia, great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering what you mentioned that there's a biological route. We have a biological route that something is missing. Yeah. 
and which is something I've experienced my whole life. And I'm wondering what is the biological root of that? Okay, to be so, um, you think of animals like us, we have drives, right? So, what are our three major drives? They're drives relate to needs. What do we need? Different models of that, a fundamental biological model is really highlights three umbrella needs mainly safety, satisfaction, connection. Okay. When we feel in our core that something is missing, in the meeting, in the present of an important need, even if it's not actually missing, but if we feel it, if we be believe it naturally, we, boom, go into a drive state. Fight, fight, flight, freeze, pursue, possess, envy, reject, cling, you know, naturally. So that that's kind of what I'm I'm saying now. Sometimes something is missing. I nearly drowned one time. I've been in situations where important relationship supplies were missing. In some ways, in my childhood, other times, I'm I'm being real about this. This is not about a happy, smiley face. Um, so, what's the takeaway? Well, for me, when something's genuinely problematic, it's to cope as best we can. All right, and second, turn to what is beneficial, supportive wholesome, enjoyable, and so forth as soon as we can, and then internalize it. So we gradually build up psychological muscles for coping with our needs, you know, with challenges to our needs, so we don't feel so stressed by that. And also extremely important, which is something I emphasize a lot, when you have the chance, take in the good. You know, let that sense of feeling safe enough in the present or satisfied enough in the present or contented enough in the present to really, really sink in. Okay, that's a general. Now, did I speak to you? I suspect I kind of... No, my question was, what if it's just, um, what if there's actually no need? What if something is not missing, but there's a constant sense that something is missing? Yeah, that's great. So I framed it. That's great. So let's dive into that. So you, you got the frame, right? Um, well, different things. One is um, to directly observe the truth, which is even though in the present I feel anxious, there's really no threat in the present, right? And there's no imminent danger either. To observe that again and again, or to observe even though I feel that I'm not cared about, I can observe the facts that in different ways, people are friendly, they do appreciate me, they like me, they love me, you know, one. Two, it's to really, really help yourself to er, 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 internalize those key experiences, all right? And to make yourself take them in. And sometimes we have to overcome fears of internalizing what we long for. I don't know if that speaks to you, but yeah. Um, and then I think there's a part of this too that sometimes gets to epigenetic processes and just biology, where the truth is, you know, we're, we're learning a lot about epigenetics, but trauma can be passed down or, or fear, trauma-related fears can be passed down generationally. Or imagine people who belong to a ethnic group that has been horribly mistreated for centuries, if not millennia. Right? And there's something that gets passed down, or maybe a person had traumatic experiences just individually or temperamentally. They're particularly anxious or particularly hungry for love. There, I think it's helpful to recognize that the alarm bell that's ringing in, in your awareness is like a car alarm that's gone off which is annoying but meaningless. In other words, just because it feels like something missing is missing is noise, not signal. We don't have to interpret it as meaningful. It's there, so we have to kind of relabel it. You know, and in, like me, I I'll, one thing that's true for me is <clears throat> I was this shy, dorky kid, and I skipped a grade, and I, late birthday, et cetera. And so I was in a lot of situations where actually I was left out. I was invisible, and the you know. It's, 
no abuse, no horrible thing, but you know, normal fourth grade, normal junior high school, right? Normal dances. You know, uh. And so now even I notice it when I'm, you know, I, I like been around the block now. I'm in these situations where I'm definitely as accomplished really as anybody else in the room. And I keep feeling this, I keep having this paradigm of relationships from my childhood that gets transferred into the present in which I feel yet again like a not as good as outsider. And so I've come to label that. I know it. I know the feeling in my body. I can feel it right now. I kind of curl over and disappear and, you know, nobody wants me. So I might as well leave before they really reject me. And, you know, I can just feel it. So I, I know it though. I know it. And so I don't believe it anymore. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you for the great. We'll finish here with Mary D. I'm asking you to unmute Mary D. Yeah, I was going to say that I'm in a situation and I'm sure you've had, I'm sure a lot of people are, are like me in that when we go to work um, and if we choose to go to work, we do meet the people that are what we can only describe as extremely difficult. And, um, <laughs> and yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah, and it feels so good, you know, it feels so good when you, you know, like I've been doing the practices and I, I'm, you know, I'm doing the pillars right now and, and, it, and I feel yeah. great. And, and then, you know, you, then a situation comes up and I, I, and I just think I run out of, I run out of whatever it is that I think will help me deal with the situation and what it is in particular and why, um, I said, I, you know, like experiencing that your, you know, your gentleness that comes across is that there's this violence in this workplace coming from this particular individual. And I experienced it this week and it's enough to make me just want to run away and say, sure. I, I don't want to be subjected to it ever again. I experienced a lot of violence in my childhood and I, and, and I, and I want to go in tomorrow and handle this skillfully. I'm talking to the manager and I want to handle it skillfully and, th and, and I'm, and I'm trying to have a sense of, you know, the best way. Well, so, so Mary, I'm so glad that we were able to hear you and we're, we're at the end here. So I'll be a little quick about something, of course, that's a pretty big deal. And it may be that there are other people who have some specific background in this kind of issue. You might want to in the chat or privately chat, Mary, if you have any resources like websites or allies, things like that. Or That said, I'll just offer some basics. Um, one, it might be helpful if you have an ally who can come with you, including someone who, if it's at all appropriate, be like a witness for what happens, because this is a big deal. You're going to your boss, your supervisor, human resources. It's a big deal. I think if it's helpful to you, so I'm going to offer several suggestions, pick and choose what's good for you, uh, is to write out in advance what you want to say. And also write, even if, if you can, a contemporaneous record of, even if it's just a handful of notes, each, of what this other person does, the setting, the date, what they said, you know, distinguish between what happened from what you experienced. Both are valid, and it's very important to get down what happened. Not what happened. Yeah, not dozens of pages. It usually takes half a page ish or less to describe what actually happened. But keep a record because you're building a paper trail, frankly. If this goes to another level, if only for yourself. It's helpful to have that. It's also helpful to have those kind of notes to speak from. And it also can help when you're going into a situation with a boss or human resources or you're contacting a state agency. I contacted the California Labor Board about an issue I had 35, 40 years ago uh, with a particular boss. So, you know, it helps to know what you're going to say. Because when you're in it, if, if you're at all like me or a normal human, uh, you know, your heart will be pounding. Yeah, yeah. So it's helpful to have your notes, your script, you know, your teleprompter, you know, your talking points. Even the great politicians, you know, they had a teleprompter they were working off of. Uh, and have some clarity about what you're going for. What's the results you'd like? What is it? Is it that others bear witness even if they can't do anything? That's good. 
is it that um, your, let's say, boss recognizes the real issue? Uh, are you wanting some change in the workplace? Are you wanting um, to be in a different office? To be, do you want that person moved to a different division? Do you want that person to be talked to so they don't harass you uh, in the ways that they have? Yeah. So. Yeah. So know what you want out of it. And along the way, it can sometimes help to talk with other colleagues. Uh, maybe people kind of like you, perhaps in that situation, who might have a similar experience. Not that you're revving each other up in a gossipy sense, not at all, in a dignified way. You're getting on solid ground with each other and witnessing. Uh, and, you know, double checking. Is this simply that this, there's a person who's just kind of obnoxious and that's what it is? And, oh, well, Fred's obnoxious, you know, or, or, hey, Fred's out of line. That's, that's whack. Maybe people like Fred did that kind of stuff 50 years ago, and we can watch it in movies from that time or read about it in books. But today, no way does Fred do that kind of stuff anymore. So kind of clarifying that. All right. I've gone on for a while. I hope not too long here. I, what do you think you about so that? I feel it. I, I, I let it sink in. I feel it. Uh, I feel you know that you're. I feel the strength and the and the and the 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 peace and and this. That's what I will uh, okay. ca carry in with. That's me. right. I'm one and of your allies. You. Yeah, I'm. With yeah, you. that's why I, I really feel you. it. Thank you very much. Now, one one last little thing. Um, even though I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a mellow guy. I teach meditation. As people who know me well, including my family, would say, when the chips are down, when you have to bring it. When you have to bring it, you find that steel inside you, and you make sure you make sure that your cause is just. You make sure that this is more than simple obnoxiousness or cluelessness. Uh, you make sure about that. But then, if you are sure about that, you um, you go in prepared to to win, to succeed in the result you want. Yeah, and so yeah, you're getting yourself prepared. You're building up. You're building up resources. You're 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 laying the groundwork. Maybe you're not going to be successful the first time around, but you keep a record. And the third time you talk about this, yeah. yeah and what's really important, I know you, I know, but it's really important, I think, for people like me to 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 really say over and over again, you know, this is not about me, you know, and my. Oops. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. It's about principle. I'm sorry, I lost. But thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, no, it's about principle. That's great. It is about you. You have needs, you have rights, you have standing. And well, but I mean, what, the problem somebody that acts, go ahead. Yeah. What gives you authority is that you're standing in principle. And, and you're, you're also, you're being courageous for the greater good. Maybe you won't succeed in this particular company or situation, but others will be watching. And in ways that are sometimes even mysterious, as people stand up, even if they don't succeed in their particular setting, the gradual accumulation of all these people who stand up can make a big difference over time. And we've certainly seen that morally. I believe that. All right. Yeah, I believe that. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mary, for bringing that up. And everybody, thank you, Rick. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.